There we go. Okay, so I'm going to be covering bank rules in QuickBooks Desktop 2014 and 2015. Uh, for uh, some of you that are using uh, 2013 or older versions, this would be brand new because the screen looks very, very different. And uh, because I only have so many, so much time to cover this, I chose to use the newer version. Now, one of the important points before I jump into the product here, I have to make three very important points. One is bank fees for credit card and for banks, although bringing the data into into QuickBooks, uh, synchronizing it or downloading it, that is the same process. However, some of the behaviors and the rules change a little bit. So I'll try to cover both. I mean, I'll, we'll start with bank, but I'll try to cover both to kind of show you where the differences are. Also, if you're a, a user, an accountant, uh, CPA, whatever, and your purpose of using bank rules is strictly to do cash basis write-up. That, that means that all the income, all the deposits come in as income, all the payments come out as checks. Um, the perspective of how you use bank rules will be a lot different than a user that's sort of working on real-time books, right? Somebody that's actually managing accounts payable, accounts receivable. And I'll try to also show you uh, some tricks behind sort of some of the real-time uh, tools for bank feeds. And the last thing is, uh, if you set up Direct Connect, uh, typically, it's all in product. You don't have to go into the bank website, uh, but you have to pay. So Direct Connect bank fees is the $10 or $15 a month fee that most most banks charge. The manual download, which I, I have a screenshot here, this is my uh, Chase account. So the manual download is when you actually go into the, your bank, you select your account, and you have to look for a button somewhere. This is Chase. Of course, every bank is different. And you would have to manually download what they call the QBO file, which is confusing because most users QBO, the, they uh, sort of uh, represent QuickBooks Online, but in this case, the QBO file actually just means a Web Connect download file. So this is what the, in, in my personal Chase account, this is what the QBO file download, and in my bank Chase, the, the previous was, this is credit card, and this is bank. So uh, bank Chase is sort of the same thing, it gives you a bunch of options, and it's the, Web, the QuickBooks Web Connect QBO. Okay, so let me jump into the product now. And Michelle, I'm not sure if you are uh, muted or not. Can you see my, my QuickBooks desktop file? Yes, yes, okay. we can see it. Thank you, Okay, perfect. All right, perfect. All right, so let me start with the bank feeds. So uh, let's talk about manual downloading. So once you go into Chase, Bank of America, whatever bank it is, you're going to download a file called whatever the bank is dot QBO. Okay, that's what the file looks like. And I want to show you some sort of uh, advanced little tidbits about these files because uh, sometimes it's interesting to see exactly the type of information that is behind it. So when I download this .qbo file, which is basically a Web Connect file, and to keep in mind there's the old terminology was OFX. That's what they used to call it, the OFX file. If I open this in Notepad, I want you to kind of give you an idea for what this looks like. This is basically just a text file. Um, this is a, an XML file with a bunch of data. Um, for example, in, in the, the text here somewhere, I won't go into too much detail, your bank account number is actually typed in here. And this is what, how QuickBooks identifies which QBO file needs to be attached to which bank account in the bank feeds. Now, I downloaded a spreadsheet version of this, which is not the same thing as opening it in Excel. Because if you open an Excel, it will, it will look kind of like the notepad. But I opened the, the, the Excel spreadsheet version of what would be the, the QBO download because I may have to revert back to this just to show you some illustrations about how the data comes in. So let me jump in the product. So once I download the file itself, the, the standard process to bring it in is we go to Banking, Bank Feeds, Import Web Connect File. It's actually the same thing as going into File, Utilities, and it should be import Web Connect file. So it's actually two places to do the exact same thing. Once I do that, I jump over to the folder where that file was downloaded. I select it and I hit open. That's how the manual feed works. I won't demonstrate the Direct Connect, but with the Direct Connect, the difference is I don't have to go into the bank and download the file. The data just gets dumped straight into, fed straight into QuickBooks. Once the QBO file is loaded in there, and this is some of the basics. Let's go into some of the advanced. Basically, you're going to go into bank feeds, and you, it's going to say transaction list. Now, this looks very different than the 2013 version uh, and, the, and anything older than that. So this is 2014 and 2015. 
when I click on transaction list, I get what the bank brings in, right? This is the raw information the bank, the bank brings in, and this looks very similar than this spreadsheet here. So I just wanna, wanted to kind of illustrate how the data comes in. Let's cover a couple of important points. Deposits, right? So we, we had a, a, a slide that said if you were an accountant just bringing in deposits as income, not really managing receivables, you would probably do something like this. You would, you would create a customer called deposits, right, or something like that, and then you would bring this information straight into, into income. So I think it's construction income or something like that. Let's hit the drop down. So if you were doing uh, cash basis sort of online banking, you would bring in the deposits straight into income. That's, that's the behavior of the user if they were using, uh, doing this just strictly sort of cash basis. Now, let me just resort this here. Now, where it would be different is, let's say I'm not doing that. Let's say I actually have to match this deposit to an actual invoice. So the way I would do that is, I would hit this drop down here and go to my, uh, add more details. So I would go to add more details. This is that action column. I would go to add more de details. And in this action column, anything that's an open transaction, whether it's an open invoice or open on deposit of funds, you can actually select them from here, right? This is assuming that I, ha I have copy of the deposit and I know exactly what's coming in. I can select these two here and then I hit add to QuickBooks and that would actually match up the two payments to that deposit. So I'm going to go ahead and hit add to Quick QuickBooks, okay? So basically what I did is I took two undeposited funds. These are two payments I received. I didn't fully go to deposit, but through the online banking, I matched the deposit. Let me show you something a little bit different. You see this deposit here for 375. I'm going to go into the customer center, and then I'm going to look for, and I'm going to just create an invoice here real quick for 375. So let me just kind of show you. I'll create an invoice for 375. I'm going to, I'm going to match it up. So where's my item code? There we go. Design fees, and I'll do 375. Okay. This is just an invoice, right? When I get back into my online banking, and I go to select, add more details. I can actually go to open invoices, and I can pick it up here. Okay. There was a sales tax in there, so I'll go back and fix it. Now the other piece I wanted to show you. It's sort of in the same realm here. Let me go back into this invoice. I'm gonna uh, turn off the sales tax. Let me just turn off the sales tax so we get the exact same amount. There we go. I'm actually going to uh, take this invoice and I'm going to receive the payment and deposit it. So you can see exactly how online banking matches it. So I'm going to go to receive payments. Okay, there's my payment, 375. I hit save and close. And then I'll do the last step, which is bring it from undeposited funds into online banking, into, into the bank itself, sorry. So I'm going to go into record deposits and I'm going to follow through and finish this deposit. Okay, so I'm just following through, finishing the deposit the manual way. What I want to show you is when I go back into my online banking, how the system, it actually grabs that deposit and matches it. So if you can see on the top right, this, this little blue box, this is automatically matched. When I click in there, it actually tells me, okay, you don't need to do anything else. We figured out that you made this deposit, the, the date and the amount matches. So it automatically makes the match for you. I don't actually have to pick the, 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 the deposit itself or the payment itself, all I have to do is accept it and I hit approve and it, and it does that piece. Another part I want to show you is I want to show you a deposit that contains a merchant fee and, and for a lot of you attendees are, are accountants and kind of do this all the time so this may just be a review for most of you but I'm going to grab one of these deposits, I'll grab this one for example. Let's say this 384.59 is the money that actually came in the bank. But the way my merchant account works is they actually take away the fee from the top, right? And the QuickBooks user typically creates an invoice for us for some other amount. So I'm gonna, just going to go back to my customer center and show you that. So let's say, for example, I have this invoice here for 409. I'm going to have this payment here. There we go. So I have this invoice for 40905, which we recognize that we received the payment and we received it. So, so now QuickBooks has an undeposited funds of 40905. The problem is, or the challenge is, that the way this particular bank works is they don't deposit the whole amount. What they do is they deposit a net amount of the fees. So how I would func how we work that is, let me go back and find that again. There we go. So the way I would work this is I would go back to the same function. 
I will go to add more details. But then this time around, I will select payment and I'm going to have a difference of 2446. So in order for me to reconcile that deposit with that received payment, I actually have to come in here. So I have to insert a line right under the, the specific line item and type here merchant fees and then come in here and put in the negative amount, negative 24. 46. Now, because this is a deposit with a negative amount, this is actually an expense, not an income. So this would actually correctly grab the deposit I received, or the actually the payment that I received, which at the moment I didn't know how much the fee was. And once the, the actual money comes in the bank, I'll recognize the difference as a merchant fee. So I'm going to hit Add to QuickBooks. So that's another example I wanted to show you. I want to show you an example now with the payment side. So I'm going to sort these by payments. I'm just going to grab a couple of payments here. So let's say, for example, uh, this right here. We have pay check for 1570.50. So right now, I don't know what this is. I would have to come in here and select the name and the account. But let's say that I do have an outstanding bill, and this check was used to pay that bill. So I'm going to go into my vendors here. And I'm going to create a bill for 1570.50. So I'm going to select here a vendor. I'll select BMW Finance. And the amount was 1750.50. Let me just double check that that was the actual amount. Yep, 1570.50. Perfect. So I transpose that number. There we go. So there's a bill, right? And it's just a bill. So I'm going to hit Save and Close. Hit save and close. Now, if I have the bill outstanding, it hasn't been paid yet. It is outstanding. I do have the ability to go into my online banking and mark the bill paid. So I'm going to show you how that works. So I'm going to go back in here, and I'm going to select this one, and I'm going to hit the drop down where it says select bills to be marked to be paid. So I'm going to click here, and then I select whoever the vendor is. And the system will give me a drop down of all the bills that are outstanding. So I'm going to select it. And basically, by doing this, I'm creating a bill payment and uh, reconciling it with my online banking, with my bank feeds at the same time. So I'm going to hit Add to QuickBooks. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit different uh, approach to this. I'm going to show you with an actual manual bill payment and how it matches. So I'm going to take a look at another payment here. Let's look at this 399 that is also BMW Finance, right? Right now, it's, it's asking me what it is. So I could actually sit there and go BMW Financial Services, auto expense, I could do the manual work. However, if there was an outstanding bill, so I'm going to go back into my bills here. I'll go back into my bill from BMW. There's this one for 399 If I had paid this bill, I'm going to go to pay bill. If I had paid it the manual way, right, this is uh, sort of a bookkeeper doing real-time accounting. If I had paid this the, the manual way, and I'm going to just put here to be printed, and, and go to pay selected bills. When I go back into my online banking, what it should do, the behavior I'm expecting it, I'm expecting it to automatically match. So I'm going to come in here and show you. Now, no longer it's in my list of things that I need to enter. It's now into this blue box here, which are the automatically matched transactions. So all I have to do at this point is select it and approve it. Okay. So that's uh, that's a little bit of a, the technical side of working with bills and invoices with uh, uh, online banking. Let's talk about the bank rules. This is the other part I want to talk about. Now, in this particular bank, I don't, I don't have a lot of uh, debit card type of expenses. So I'm going to show you the bank rules with my credit card. So I'm going to go back into my bank feeds. I'm going to go into bank feeds here. And then instead of going through my bank, I'm going to show you with my credit card. I have a lot more expenses on the credit card, so this will be easier to show. And I'm going to go here to transaction list. And what I typically like to do is I like to uh, do the ones that are common, vendors that repeat themselves over and over, uh, first to kind of get rid of more transactions at a time. So what I do is I click on download it as, and what that does is basically sorts it. And then we'll start with this one, iTunes. Right? I have one, two, three, four, five transactions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to match one of these. So I'm going to select one, and then I'm going to make this one the pay iTunes. So I'll just create the vendor here. Okay, and then on the account I put here office supplies, and then I'm going to hit select quick add. Now what the system will do is say, wait a minute, Hector, since we're trying to get smarter here, I, I want to grab the next transaction that is that says iTunes 
and automatically categorize it to office supplies. Are you okay with that, right? So I can actually um, ignore it and say, no, 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 this is a one-time thing, don't do it in the future, or I can just hit okay and I'll actually grab it. And what that will do is it will actually move all the iTunes transactions, I'm going to resort these, it will move the iTunes transaction to this orange mode, which is changed. Okay, this used to be called changed by renaming rules, now it's just called changed by rules. So when I go into here, the system automatically says, oh, Hector, I already know what this is. This is the vendor iTunes, or in this case I wrote Tunes, and I'm, I'm making it Office Supplies. And at that point I can just go to Add, Approve, and it will add all three in one shot. Right? So that's kind of the, the speed up process of working with when the vendors are the exact same. And I'm, I'm looking at the time here, and you got about two more minutes. So let's, let me talk about another one. So let's, let me go down here, and then I'm going to look for a vendor that is similar but not the exact same. So like this one, ExxonMobil, for example. If you look at four transactions from ExxonMobil, you would guess that if I, do, if I add one, the system will automatically add all four, but it doesn't work quite that way. So I'm going to show you exactly how the bank rules work. So I'm going to select the vendor, and I'll put here automobile expense. And then I'm going to go to Quick Add, and then I'll, I'll accept the rule and hit OK. The problem is, I'm going to go back and sort these again so I can show you. We're going to go down to Exxon. The, the problem with this is, is because there was a couple of numbers at the end. The system didn't catch these last two here. It only caught that one. So in order to fix this problem, I have to go into the rules themselves, and I'm going to go into the ExxonMobil rule, and I'm going to edit it. And basically, these are the guts of, of QuickBooks's bank feeds memory. This is saying, if the vendor is exactly this, rename it to ExxonMobil, make it automobile. However, the number that varies, because maybe every gas station has a code or every store, so all I have to do is take this away, and I know some vendors call it Exxon, some call it mobile, so all I'll do is I'll just basically get rid of it and just leave Exxon, because there's really no other vendor name Exxon out there. So all I'm saying is, I'm saying it's going to be a simpler rule. As long as it's got the word Exxon in it, whether it has numbers or not, rename it and recategorize it for me. So I'm going to hit save, and then I'm going to close this, and then we're going to see that now when I resort these as uh, by name, and I go back to ExxonMobil, it actually changed all three of them. So at that point, because they're already selected, I can just go to Batch, Add and Approve, and it approves all of them. Okay? And the very last thing, actually, I don't have any more time. <laughs> but I want to show you American Airlines real quick. I'll do this. I have one more minute. So I'm going to show you this one. This one, instead of doing it manually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the bank rule before I even do the first transaction. So I'm going to go into Bank Rule, and then I'm going to create a new rule. Okay? So the rule says, I'm going to put here American Airlines, and it says, if it contains the word American, so I'm just making it simple here, change the pay payee to American Airlines, I'm just creating a, a quick vendor here called American Airlines, and I'll click on Add, whoops, let's go here to, I'll put this, uh, I'm going to use a different vendor because it's, it, it didn't, I, I should have added the vendor before, and then I'm going to categorize this to travel, okay, um, actually, let me just do it, let me do it correctly, so I'll put here American Airlines vendor, okay, and then I'll hit OK, and then basically uh, I'm telling the system that if it has the word, if it contains the word uh, American at all, reclassify it to travel. So I'm gonna let me just go back here. For some reason, the system's automatically switching it to uh, that and. I may have to, there it is, the system was doing it, maybe I was hitting too many buttons at once. So when I hit the rule from zero, I haven't even done any manual transactions, you see the transactions automatically get changed into American Airlines here, and they get categorized to travel. So I just do batch enter, uh, and batch approve, and I'm good to go.